Okay, Dr. Karul, very, very, very warm welcome to, uh, you know, to you for, for joining us at the Digital in One by the Rainbow Lit Fest, Queer and Inclusive. It's a big, big deal for us. It's a huge day, uh, you know, to have someone of your stature address a very, very queer centric, uh, let's say, set of um, the audience. And so I want to know, how does it feel, Dr. Uh, if I may call you that, Doctor. Uh, <laughs> call me whatever you like. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. So, Doctor Tharoor, how do you, uh, how does it feel, really, addressing an audience of this sort? Because largely, you must have spoken at very mainstream heterosexual kind of groups. Yeah, you know, I mean, to begin with, I would argue that that the question itself yes. implies uh, a sense of difference that oughtn't to be there. I, I believe we ought to normalize. Um, our connections with each other across these divisions. And to my mind, um, uh, it's not my business, frankly, what should be the sexual orientation of audiences I address. Um, I'm assuming that every audience I address is de facto mixed, that there are people uh, in that audience, whether avowed in the closet or otherwise, uh, who, who don't share the sexual orientation of others around them. But that's not why they're there. They're there because they're interested in my book or they're interested in what I have to say or the ideas or they disagree with me and they want to argue with me, whatever it may be. That's really the level at which we ought to pitch our discourse. So I actually, uh, Sharif, if you'll forgive me, I'll <laughs> reject your question because my uh, answer is just as I embrace difference. And I, I believe very profoundly, um, for example, as a Hindu, that that acceptance of difference is central to my faith and my, my beliefs and my and my attitudes to life. Uh, acceptance of difference also embraces um, uh, uh, other kinds of inclinations than the heteronormative uh, orientation. So um, we're all different and we're all Indian and some of you are voters and I want that. So I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> I'm going to come to the Hindu point a little later in this sure. uh, uh, you know, keynote conversation with you. So my first question really, I mean, since we rejected the first question I asked, uh, the first one was when you moved the private member bill, you know, yeah. what was in your mind? Uh, you know, what, what came to you at that point? Because it was quite, quite surprising for, I think, a large number of people to, to find any politician, an Indian politician to, to actually, you know, look at Section 377 and want it read down. Well, you know, the fact is that I, I always found it peculiar that uh, this remnant of British colonial law criminalizing homosexuality, which had become a legal tool for the harassment of sexual minorities within India, had been allowed to stand. But then you remember in 2009, which was the year I got elected to parliament, uh, a liberal Delhi High Court judgment essentially decriminalized 377. So for four years, one didn't need to think about it because essentially it was no longer an issue. And, and gay people were out and open and free and there was no, no problem. To everyone's astonishment, in December 2013, four and a bit years later, uh, the Supreme Court uh, overruled the High Court judgment. And suddenly it was criminal again. Now, at that point, immediately I felt this was an outrage. For four years, the heavens haven't fallen. Indian society did not collapse. Uh, just because bigots had petitioned to revise and reverse that enlightened ruling, why should you actually set the clock back for human rights? in this case, gay rights in our country. So I decided to do something about it. But in fact, legislatively, we couldn't have done anything in the beginning of 2014 because thanks to the elections coming up that year, yeah. budget session was a truncated two-week session. And in those two weeks, no new legislation was introduced, just a budget was passed. And then the, they, they adjourned and the model code of conduct kicked in and so on. So everything depended on liberal-minded people coming back to power in 2014, which, as you know, didn't happen. Now, I had found the Supreme Court's 2013 ruling, as opposed to the High Court's 2009 ruling, antithetical to everything I believed in, my faith in India's commitment to pluralism, uh, my notion of democracy, which, to my mind, embraces a multitude of identities, despite the differences that divide us, differences of caste, of religion, of region, of language, and indeed of sexual preference. And so that's why I decided I had to introduce a private member's bill. So I came up with a bill that would simply have decriminalized, I didn't even abolish Section 377. Yeah. I just said we decriminalize all consensual sex between consenting adults. Because you know, immediately when you talked about 377, people said that's yeah. the only protection against pedophilia and various yeah. other, other things. So I said, 
consensual sex between consenting adults, no issue because the government has no place in the bedroom. Criminal activity, including pedophilia, philia, underage sex, etc., should not in any way be affected. But this whole notion of what is unnatural. Now, as you know, a, a vocal section of homophobes in the BJP voted overwhelmingly against even introducing the bill. In fact, um, mm -hmm. uh, they did it twice. Uh, and, and when they, the second time they did it, um, by the way, they were on both occasions nearing comments made about my alleged uh, personal interest in the bill. I mean, previously, the same BJP guys have been accusing me of being too much inclined on the other side. Now, suddenly, I'm told that it's because of my personal interest. So I responded that one doesn't need to be a cow to defend animal rights, which yeah. didn't, go over, <laughs> didn't go over so well. But the, but the truth is that uh, that that entire thing for me was not about sex. It wasn't even really about uh, queer behavior or gay rights. But it was about human beings. It was about human rights. It was about human freedoms. It was about what India was all about. To my mind, this kind of narrow-minded, bigoted India that was persecuting some of its own citizens for something that had nothing to do with the state, that was an unworthy India. It was an India I didn't want to see continuing in that way. And that's why I felt I should stand up for what I believe. Dr. Tarun, you know uh, that while you moved the uh, private member bill, the support from within your own party, I think, uh, from what we read in the newspapers and saw also, wasn't as much as perhaps you were looking for. So how do you see this whole political landscape right now? I mean, even within your party or other parties, I mean, BJP, we know that in the manifesto, uh, there wasn't anything about uh, queer rights or LGBTQIA rights, you know, right. uh, as such. Uh, but uh, so, so how do you how do you see this whole political landscape and as far as our rights go? So look, I mean, let me be very frank. In the party, uh, the party leadership at that point, Sonia Gandhi and Rahul Gandhi were totally supportive of my bill, and they said so in the meeting of party MPs. But party MPs found various excuses, some legitimate, because very often uh, MPs from far away take flights on Friday afternoon, and the government has ensured that the bills only come up, private members bills only come up on Friday afternoon. So okay. Friday afternoon, many were simply not there. That was one genuine uh, problem. And frankly, as a problem, I would say that, uh, that that meant that we didn't have the numbers. Then amongst those who were around, some, when they realized what my bill was about, quietly slipped off to have a cup of tea instead of stay and vote. So there were, there were some real challenges. And you know, it's interesting, in its 2013 judgment, the Supreme Court actually said that Section 377 must be decided by legislators and not by judges. It was a cop-out, but it was a fair point they made. But it became very clear to me during my two attempts to introduce this bill that thanks to the prejudices of the vocal and motivated, a few dozen vocal and motivated BJP members, and the cowardice or lack of courage of non-BJP MPs, it became clear that our parliament was not up to the task. I had a couple of conversations with people on the BJP side, who had told me they would support me, and who, seeing the ferocity of the opposition within their party, completely turned around and either didn't say anything uh, or actually actively voted against my stand, having told me the opposite. So I felt that as long as the BJP is in power and has a majority, they will outshout any legislative attempt to undo the injustice of 377. And that's why after the second attempt, I made a statement, which I think some of you were disappointed by, where I said, listen, I mean, Einstein talks about insanity being doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. After the second effort, I'm not going to reintroduce the bill. I'm going to urge, and I spoke at that time to the Nas Foundation people, Anjali Gopal, yeah. called me a couple oh, of yes. and I said, the only way forward, clearly, is for you to try the legislative route. And, uh, and then two things were tried, of course. There was the review petition, which is the only legal recourse left for a Supreme Court judgment. And then there was that whole other case, Napte Johar and others. Yes, yes, yes. My good friend Aman Nath was part of that process. And, and, and I would say that the, um, the, uh, the right case found the right bench. And that's when the court uh, lived up to its uh, previously exemplary record of expanding human rights in India through its expansive interpretations of the statutes. So, so I believe that they, they, they did the right thing eventually, uh, but my gosh, it took a while, didn't it? It took, took uh, such a long while and so much so that there was this pent up kind of, uh, you know, angst, uh, anxiety, etc. that on that day, you, I think everyone saw 
what the Supreme Court looked like in terms of just the sheer presence of uh, people from the community. And, but you know, you raised a very interesting point, uh, and you'd perhaps know the lawyer Anand Grover, who was leading yeah, the case that. with Nas, yeah, uh, Lawyers Friend Collective. Us, yeah. yeah. So Anand at, uh, at a book launch, actually my own book launch uh, last year, and he said uh, that uh, the only option that perhaps before for the community is not politicians or the legislature, and we have to move the courts. And, I agree. and that would be, you know, and, and that might be the only way uh, forward. And that could be a reflection even of current politics or whatever other reasons that he, he said that. So I want to know from you that that being uh, the kind of reality we live with, and also there is a, a strong feeling that we need a political voice. You know, we do need people who take forth our story. Do you think there is space for people from our community to, to, to kind of, you know, come up front in, in key pack, car parties like the Congress, you know, national parties like that, or other even regional parties? And, and what do, you, do you see that happening? Do you see that happening? Because, you know, many minorities are, ref, are in a way represented. You know, you do have uh, Dalit leaders, you have you know, Muslim, Christian leaders, you now have women leaders and all of that. So is there space really for our community? Well, you know, I think there the route you take um, has to be very calibrated to the political realities of India. Number one, we have a parliamentary system, which means parties are very important. It's the party that wins the seat. It's not the individual or the cause. Second, uh, there is unfortunately uh, for, 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 for narrower interests, uh, there is no proportional representation. So let's say that uh, a, a gay platform might get, say, 10% of the vote across India in, in a proportional representation system that would give you a voice in parliament. But getting 10% anywhere in any constituents in India will not give you the seat. You might even lose your deposit. So the problem is an exclusively gay platform runs the risk of never actually translating into a parliamentary voice. So my suggestion would have been for the gay community to pursue its politics through pressure groups rather than through a political party. In other words, individual members can join individual parties depending on their other ideological orientations. Mm. But the gay pressure group would pressure candidates of all parties, saying we and our voters will support whoever endorses our uh, manifesto list, as it were. And that means that you would come up with certain points, a checklist of, let's say, four or five things you want uh, government to do. And let's say there are five candidates, BJP, Congress, uh, whatever, AIMIM, uh, uh, Samajwadi, different parties. And you would say to them, any of you that's willing to support our points, we'll get our support and we'll campaign amongst our members and amongst the gay community for you. Conversely, if you reject our suggestion, we will urge our members not to vote for you. Now, it's your choice. We may only be 10%, but can you afford to give up, give up 10% of your voters? Mm -hmm. That, I think, will be, in our system, a more effective tactic, in my personal view, and I stress it's a personal view, than um, you're trying to start your own political movement. Having said that, uh, the Congress party has been quite welcoming. I think there was a, a ceremony in, in Mumbai, or was it in Pune, somewhere in Maharashtra, a few months ago, in which a number mm -hmm. of gay uh, and, and, and I mean, it was queer and transgender people joined the Congress party. The Congress party has yeah. historically been open to alternative uh, uh, ideas and, and individuals. And I think that if you find that you have a comfortable home there, why not come in? I would only urge that as in Western democracies, that gay people do not allow themselves to be confined only to the agenda of homosexual rights. Yeah. I mean, I think a gay person would command more political support if he or she were also an expert on, say, public health, on environmental issues, on uh, foreign policy, on security, whatever it may be. I mean, how does a Leo Varadkar, who is openly gay, become prime minister of Ireland? Because yeah. he was highly respected for his politics. And the, the, the homosexual issue came second in, in the terms of his popular yeah. appeal to the electorate. So again, that, I, I mean, I'm, I'm very conscious that in saying all this, I'm sounding like the sort of hetero guy who's preaching down to you guys. It's not, I'm just giving you what I see as common sense advice while fully respecting your own rights to take it the way you want to take it. It's interesting you, you talked about, you know, 
you know, the various things, because often the community, even as individuals, uh, there is always this kind of, not exactly a conflict, there is this dilemma of whether you put your sexuality first or whether you get people to recognize you for the various aspects of yourself. You know, exactly. Whether, you know, professionally or emotionally and, 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 you know, whatever else. But it also brings me to another point was, do you think the community needs to look at other minority groups when they're, you know, and, and, forging larger alliances because there's so much of common ground you know when you look at women it's patriarchy when you look at other you know within our community we have we have dalit queer we have christian queer we have um, queer muslim we have all of those uh, you know groups out there we have uh, you know disabled people or special people as you as some people like to call them so do you think those larger alliances as is a way to go to create because we invoke more or less the similar rights or space and no, society. I mean, I, I, in, in parliamentary systems, the Gadbandan logic often works. So yes, okay. create, <laughs> create alliances and coalitions of different people. And that obviously helps. You know, obviously, if you're, if you're, if you're um, uh, putting forward, for example, a Dalit queer thing, you have to have a message that appeals to Dalits and a message that appeals to queers and, and particularly appeals to both sets of people. So, I mean, to people who combine both sets of identities. So, that kind of thing is definitely worth doing. Yeah, that's that's something we call intersections. Uh, the there you go. Right now, yeah. So right. just another, yeah. There's another thing. You know, uh, there are four petitions right now on same-sex marriage of different kinds. Uh, uh, you know, within the courts in Kerala and in Delhi. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, you as a parent, as a father, that in case you had uh, a queer child, what is it that you would, you know? prioritize is it would you look at anti-discrimination laws first over marriage uh, because there is an obsession with marriage in in india and but there isn't that much let's say room or appreciation or respect for a person who wants to make certain choices yeah or wants to be an individual so and and there are other forms of discrimination before the person even comes to marriage so how do you how do you weigh this out you know between marriage rights and other rights of discrimination, you know, which you... Well, I think, I think discrimination, discrimination ought to be the bedrock. I actually, uh, for those who are interested in legislation, I actually introduced an anti-discrimination bill in Parliament yes. that yeah. would forbid discrimination on any grounds, including sexual. So it, it would have been something that um, in principle would have benefited Dalits uh, from being discriminated against, Muslims being denied housing because of their religion, uh, uh, gay people being denied opportunities because of their orientation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That didn't get very far either, but at least it wasn't as ferociously opposed as the Section 377 attempt. What I will say, however, is that um, for me, if you look at the fact that we are uh, claiming to be uh, a proud democracy, and our Supreme Court in various judgments has shown that it's conscious of international human rights standards, then we ought to actually look at what the rest of the world is also doing. Sexual acts between two adult males were made legal in Sweden in 1944, in England in 1967. Germany decriminalized homosexuality across the entire country upon German reunification in 1990. The uh, US Supreme Court struck down sodomy laws nationwide in their uh, Lawrence versus Texas decision in 2003. And, and I would argue that for India to be out of step with much of the international community only embarrasses us before other democracies. So it's, it's, for me, it's important that we establish a principle of anti-discrimination. We can't pass a bill or can't pass a law. Let's get the courts to rule on it. The courts are more conscious of international standards than the government. Is. And therefore, for example, you ask about marriage. I mean, uh, to my mind, if, if we had to settle for civil partnership as an option for the gay community rather than marriage uh, in the formal sense, uh, even that could be an improvement because you're eroding um, opposition from the, the powers that be uh, step by step. And it was very interesting when the government was asked by the Supreme Court when they were about to overturn 377 for their views, the government seeing the writing on the wall decided they were not going to oppose what the Supreme Court was clearly heading towards. So they said, you know, we have no opposition to your reading the law as you see fit, except only on this issue of criminalization 
and by 377, not on any other rights pertaining yeah, there to, yeah. including civil marriage. So the government is likely to oppose marriage. And the question is, is that a fight in today's environment that you can win? So these are part of the, the, the challenges we have to face. I, I, my, my gut instinct is, um, as a, somebody who's seen politics up close now for a dozen years, is to pick your battles wisely. If you feel it's a battle you can prevail in through these cases, great. If these cases go badly, I might regroup and say that it violates the principle of equality before the law that, for example, a pair of homosexuals in a stable relationship are unable to have any civil rights when it comes to a hospital operation or an inheritance. Uh, of course, yeah. you can write a will, but short of the automatic inheritance, right? So choosing a place of burial or a mode of disposal of the remains, all of these things that in a heterosexual relationship, the wife can do. So if you were married to a woman, she can sign the consent form for surgery, emergency surgery oh, yes. in the hospital. She can decide whether you're going to be cremated or buried or left to the vultures. She can decide whether you are, you know, she, she automatically inherits if you haven't written a will. All of these benefits that in perhaps very stable, very loving homosexual partnership that has lasted as long as this hypothetical marriage, that that partnership has no such rights. And a case arguing that we don't care whether you call it marriage, we don't care if you call it civil partnership, but we should have the same rights. To my mind, that might have been tactically a better way to go. But I understand the feelings of these people. I think of two of the cases I'm familiar with, you mentioned four that are currently pending. One was a couple that had actually been legally married in America. They were yes. Indian Americans, so they moved back to India. And they said, why is our marriage not recognized? And that's become a real issue because, for example, if they were American diplomats, posted at the U.S. Embassy, their marriage would de facto be recognized because the Indian government would have to grant the spouse of the diplomat all the rights that a heterosexual spouse would have had. So there are double standards involved, and I think it'd be very interesting to see how the case rules on that. But my argument is a little more simple, a little more basic. It would be simply to argue that all Indians under the Constitution have equal rights. I am an Indian, and, and you would say, if my partner dies, I don't have the same yeah. rights that I would have if, if it was a woman rather than a man. Why is that so? And you can actually begin now, I think, to start pushing the envelope because, in my view, the court's awareness of international human rights standards and its desire not to be embarrassed in front of the world may help you. That's, that's interesting. I think this debate's going to carry on. We're waiting for the, sure. this, you know, on, on, and it's, I think we're quite split on this idea of whether it's marriage or discrimination, but there's a growing sense, I guess, uh, that uh, it could be, you know, that anti-discrimination. There's a large group which believes that that's our first steps, you know, but we have to see. So, uh, Dr. Tarul, you know, obviously everyone knows you're a, you're a well-known author. You've had 22 or more best-selling books. And uh, so one of the books, obviously, in the recent years is, uh, which was, I mean, maybe, maybe most of your books recently have been controversial one way or the other. Uh, <laughs> but Why I Am Hindu in 2018, which uh, so it's two years ago, that book, I mean, I think you put across your idea and perhaps it's an idea that it's, it's not perhaps, I think there's an idea shared by a lot of people on what they believe is uh, being a Hindu. But the book doesn't really go necessarily into the area of sexuality. But you made a point right at the beginning uh, about being a Hindu and inclusivity, you know, so to say. So how do you see us as a community within the larger, you know, Hindu space of, of Hinduism? Or... Well, I, I actually made that argument, I think, if not the first time, then the second time that I introduced the bill, that mm -hmm. one of the incongruous things about the BJP's uh, position is that they claim to be a Hindu party, but they're rejecting millennia of Hindu practice in favor of a British colonial law. The Indian ethos, I argued, has historically been liberal towards sexual difference. Hmm. Neither mythology nor history reveals any record of persecution or prosecution of sexual deviancy in India. That's what the BJP would call it. And Indian culture, Hindu culture, historically embraces such differences, right? So Shikhandi in the Mahabharat was born female and became male. The Ardha Narishwara, half man, half woman, is venerated by, by many Hindus. And though we don't talk about it, temple sculptures across India depict homosexual acts. And yet the BJP, the party of Hindutva, chooses to be blind to this Hindu tradition 
and prefers to support a colonial law that the British themselves outgrew as, as, late, as early as 67. So I would argue that the BJP has betrayed Hindu values, has abandoned our culture, our tolerance, our history of tolerance, in favor of a Victorian moral code that was imposed by the British. And, and now, of course, you can also come in my newest book, I talk about the civic nationalism of India, yeah. which is anchored in liberal constitutionalism. This is my book, The Battle of Belonging. And I would say that it, by the standards of civic nationalism, it is a duty of our, of our legislature and our courts to affirm a pluralist India that accommodates all the identities within our country, lest we undermine the freedom of identity, the freedom of expression that is the backbone of Indian democracy. So what is bizarre about all of this is why uh, this party of Hindu chauvinism uh, has, has gone in the direction yeah. that it has uh, and betrayed Hindu traditions. But interestingly, I mean, you know, so you've also made, you've had these interviews in UK and various other parts uh, where you've also talked about what India lost in terms of wealth. Yeah. Uh, and so do you think we also lost a lot of culture because this is uh, a lot of what was considered to be, you know, Hindu culture as, as what you were talking about. So that's also a huge loss, which which perhaps is uh, not easy to repair given the mindsets, not just of the BJP. There are, I think, families, there are various people who still struggle, you know, if they come out, you know. And, and Sharif, this, Sharif, you're, you're totally correct. In fact, um, I've talked about in, in the book, the An Era of Darkness, Inglorious yeah. Empire, and the foreign version. Uh, I've talked about the fact that there is this tremendous assault on uh, what I call colonizing the Indian mind. And certainly Indian attitudes to homosexuality are entirely a result of British colonialism and not of cultural practice before. In fact, um, uh, homosexual behavior was not just condoned, it was fairly open and, and people were relaxed about it. It's not, there was, I don't think the percentage of Indians who were inclined that way, uh, you know, ever was higher or, 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 or low. I think in every society, there is a certain percentage of the population who, who are naturally inclined uh, in, in a non-heterosexual way. And the only difference is how the rest behave towards these people. Are they judged because of their inclinations? Uh, is there an attempt made to quote unquote cure them and treat them and so on? Is there an attempt made to oppress them and persecute them? Is there an attempt made to, to, to blackmail and exploit them? Uh, those things say much more about the society than they do about that particular community. And so to my mind, it was quite bizarre. You know, <laughs> when <coughs> the Supreme Court in December 2013 recriminalized yeah. 377 and homosexuality. That same Supreme Court, four months later, actually introduced the notion of a third gender uh, in Indian documentation. Yes. It actually gave people the right to identify as neither male nor female. Nalsa. Yeah. A box for third. Now, this is something which shows you the contradictions involved on the, on the part of the court. Uh, and, you know, the argument that the, um, the December 2013 judgment made that this is a job for lawmakers and not for judges. Uh, has actually been debunked by, by a, a wonderful comment by Justice Narima, who actually was one of the judges on the bench hearing the 377 petition. Seven, seven, the whole yes. object of fundamental rights is to give the court power to strike down laws which a majoritarian government, you know, which is influenced only by votes, will not repeal. He says a court should not wait for majority in the governments to repeal laws if the law, in our view, is unconstitutional, it is our duty to strike it down. Yes. I found that a very impressive and courageous statement of principle by Justice Nariman. The Constitution sets forward a standard of non-discrimination. I genuinely believe if you guys were to take all the civil rights of, of homosexuals up to the Supreme Court on the argument of discrimination, um, you will do far better than expecting a legislative majority, and particularly of the the very narrow-minded and bigoted party ruling us today to actually uh, take steps in your favor. Whatever you can't get the executive to do, whatever you can't get the legislatures to vote for, to do. you can get the courts to do in my view. So Dr. Tharoor, I'm, I, I know we're going to be running out of time or we are. Already we have run out of time. time. I, I just have one last question before, sure. you, before sure. you leave. Uh, is that, you know, you've talked about history, you've talked about, uh, you know, we talked about your book, Why I'm 
a Hindu and now the latest one out. Do you think it's time to, to reclaim certain spaces for ourselves using history as a means? We've had some fabulous books many, many, many years ago, like Salim Kidwa and Ruth Vanita, who've done Same Sex Love in India. But do you think we need to reclaim history? And what would your thoughts be on that, to retell some of these stories so that uh, it starts finding its own space? Very much so. I'll go beyond that, though. First of all, I think that you must tell the stories. I was very strongly, I, a very close family friend uh, is gay, and he won't mind me mentioning his name because he's written a very powerful book about growing up gay in India, and that's Siddharth Dubey. Yes, yeah, and, 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 and what Siddharth experienced and, and had to go through, even though some gays will tell you it's probably mild by comparison with what many of them suffered, is, a, is an example of what is wrong from the mere point of view of Indians and what kind of country we are and we want to be. There are many decent-minded heterosexual Indians who would never want a human being to endure what many gay people in India go through as a routine matter growing up in this country. I'm just horrified by the fact that for so many years, um, and you know, uh, one of the excuses that was often made, oh, there are not even a thousand arrests a year in the whole country under 377. Oh, but for number. so many years, the law was a tool for harassment, for persecution, for blackmail uh, of, of sexual minorities within India, forcing millions of gay men and women to live in fear and secrecy, undermining HIV prevention efforts, contributing to depression and suicides. Uh, but I would say that you should have arguments across the board. You certainly need an argument on the... Uh, narrative front, tell the stories of human beings who deserve better, showcase more people who are willing to come out. I know some fairly prominent Indians yes. um, who are experts and respected experts in certain fields, columnists, economists, uh, yes. scholars, and so on, who never mentioned their sexual orientation. Uh, and, and maybe one should encourage more to come out because there could be role models. Uh, there are people who already have a certain standing in society. Um, and, and that could help. Uh, a, a third argument that I'm surprised has never been made is how expensive homophobia is for the economy. The World oh, yeah. Bank did a study, and the last one I saw was 2014, I don't know if they've ever done yeah, it again, correct. that hmm. said that India suffers a loss of between 0 0.1 and 1.7% of GDP because of homophobia. So all of these arguments, all of these narratives, all of these stories need to be told, and in that degree, the space must be reclaimed. But my final message to you uh, uh, that I think will most effectively, it, it, for me, the most effective <laughs> appeal you can make to the so-called mainstream, the, the, the non-homosexual community, the non-gay community, the non-rainbow community of India, which <laughs> is the majority apparently, is for you to say to them, is this the kind of country you want India to be? I think it, it, all the things you and I have talked about for the last half an hour, are fine, uh, but, but th there, is, there is a simple argument. Why do you want to reduce India to a country where a section of your own people are unable to lead normal lives? Can any Indian Democrat hold his or her head up with pride and walk with dignity and freedom as long as somebody from the LGBT community is unable to hold his or her head up with pride and walk with dignity and freedom? I mean, this is the classic democratic principle. If you want a country where all are equal in rights, where all talents are respected, and you want everyone to contribute effectively to the growth, prosperity, and safety, and security of your country, don't you think that you need to actually uh, 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 end discrimination in your own interest? You know, don't you want an India you can be proud of? Do you want an India where you're demonizing a section of your people? I mean, I, I think that argument should work to most fair-minded and democratic-minded Indians. And certainly those were the considerations that impelled me to take a stand, even though I'll be very honest with you, a very uh, significant number of prominent people in my constituency uh, 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 turned against me. Or let me say, I had people who were my political supporters saying to me, why must you do this? And a very, very prominent figure from a religious leadership, I won't name him because he'd be immediately identified as a private conversation. He said to me, listen, we like you. Why are you doing something that will make us... I'm sorry. Why are you doing something that will make us turn against you? And I said, 
because it's not about you, it's not about me, it's about not about any of the things you like or dislike in politics, it's simply about human rights for people you're not bothering to notice. And I think, I think some of these stands in the, at the end of the day, uh, if you have the courage of your convictions, most people will, will respect that. And I don't believe I lost any votes because of the stand I took. That's, that's, that's my, you're a, treat, my conviction. You're, a treat, you're a three time winning MP. There you are. So, I mean, I, I, I actually increased my majority between 2014 and 19. Uh, during that period is when I took the public stand that uh, uh, if people had decided to hold it against me, they should have nursed a grudge about that. It didn't even become much of a campaign issue. So I think India is evolving and moving on. We just need to have people standing up for what's right. I hope I've done so today with you and you yeah. should get more and more people to do so uh, across the country. Good luck and I wish Rainbow have... a very successful festival. Thank you so much, Dr. Thiru. Thank you so much for, for being with us. And uh, yeah, it is a historic moment uh, to have someone like you with us. And I hope that you make it to the physical festival you know, sometime in the future. In a post-COVID world. In a post-COVID world, yes. yes. Thank, thank you, you so all. much. Dr. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.